Welcome to this Lunch and Learn on Managing Period Ends, Year Ends, and 1099 Reporting in Sage ERPX3. Let's start by dealing with some of the questions that are going to be surfacing in our minds as we prepare for month and year end processing. Some of the questions that we would have would include, have all transactions been entered for the period? Have all transactions been posted for the specific period or year that we're closing? What processes need to be run to physically close out a period or to close out a year? How do I enter closing entries at the end of the year? And also, how do I carry forward balances? And most importantly, what happens if I need to reopen a period or a year at any point in time? These kinds of questions at month and year end generally relate to some of the anxiety, stress, and panic that we feel at these sensitive times. Hopefully this Lunch and Learn will alleviate some of that anxiety, stress, and panic by showing you how simple month and year end processing can be with Sage ERP X3. Because X3 provides tools to ensure transactions are processed, validated, and finalized quite easily. A pre-closing report is included that you can run to identify any issues that you would encounter as part of your period or year-end close. So we can identify, before we even get into the process itself, we can identify what needs to be done before we can actually close out our period or our year. Of course, there are simple close processes, and there are simple reopen processes as well. All in all, Sage ERP X3 provides an easy, fast, and effective way to deal with period and year ends to hopefully alleviate some of that anxiety and stress that you feel at month and year ends and uh, make things a little bit easier for you. In this session, you'll learn how to close a fiscal period, how to close a fiscal year, and how to work with 1099 features that were introduced as of version 6.4 for year-end reporting. And finally, how to successfully navigate the month and year-end process with ease. It's important to note that we're going to focus in this session on the logistics or the mechanics of performing period ends and year ends. Uh, reporting, reconciliations, all of those fun things that we do at the end of a period, at the end of the year, uh, those will be tackled in other like lunch and learns. We want to focus on the actual mechanics of performing uh, the year end and the period end in this particular lunch and learn. Because everybody has different reporting requirements. Uh, every organization has different right. yes, types of know. reports and but types I, I of have... reconciliations that they, they need to perform to, it, no. to their organization at the end of a period of the, end of the year. So this particular management focuses only on the steps okay. necessary for closing out a period and closing out a year and dealing with the 99 right. processing. And further to that, our agenda for this function learn will be to start with the steps for period end. What anybody are doing? Then we'll discuss steps for year end. And finally, we'll talk about 1099 processing, starting with a recap of setup and transaction entry details for 1099, because this is something uh, relatively new that was released in version 6.4. And then we'll get into how it impacts year end calculations and reporting of 1099. So let's start out with the steps for period close. And it should be noted when we're talking about period ends and year ends, the backups are critical and are necessary. You should always do a backup before and do a backup after uh, your, your period close or your year end. Uh, and you should always, as a rule of procedure, when you're performing your period end, always make sure that the backup systems that you're using in your environment are functioning. You should do that a lot more often than as a period end, but as a procedure, you should you should uh, pay a little bit closer attention to it as part of the period end. So backups are always first and foremost. The actual steps in X3 for performing a period end are quite simple. First of all, you make sure all of your transactions are entered. And that would include not just your daily and routine transactions that you're entering, your invoices, uh, your purchase invoices, and so on. 
But your recurring journal entries that you have, or your recurring well, transactions, you know, you any accruals that you need to record, <laughs> reconciliations and matching, simulation entries, and reversals. Anything that you need to enter in that period should be entered. So the next step after transaction entry would obviously be transaction posting. And again, that includes validating your invoices and your, your purchase invoices and any other transactions that you have. But it would also mean running some of those functions within X3 that generate journal entries for transactions. Specifically, for stock valuations, we've got the stock accounting interface that will generate the journal entries required for valuing stock. And for valuing work in progress, we have a WIP accounting interface that would need to be run again. Those would need to be run to generate the journal entries, and that's the whole goal of going through transaction entry and transaction uh, posting, is to make sure that everything that needs to be entered in that period has been entered and has flown and has flowed all the way up to the general ledger for record keeping. After you do your transaction entry and your transaction posting, there is a final validation that needs to be run, and that's a process with an X3 that allows us to take all of our journal entries in that period and mark them as final. We can't have any temporary uh, journal entries sitting in a period that we're going to close. We need to finalize them. So there is a step that you can take to run final validation to finalize everything. And then after that, you'd be ready to close the period. And you close the period in the fiscal periods window. Now, to help you get to that stage to close the period, there is a report that you can print called the pre-closing verification report. And that's a report that will tell you anything that needs to be performed before you can actually close out the period. Now, if you just went and tried to close the period, you would get a log file telling you the same things that are in the pre-closing validation report. So to save you from that extra step of generating that log file for you to go back and do it, it's, it's a helpful step to actually run that pre-closing verification report before you go and close the period so that you can resolve any outstanding issues before you close your period. And so let's take a look at that now by going to X3. First thing that, uh, that will simplify us for navigating to period ends and year ends within X3 would be visual process flows. Visual process flows are just alternate ways of navigating through menus in X3. And I've got several out-of-the-box visual process flows that I've already set up in my period and year end tab. For those of you that are new to visual process flows, to add a visual process flow, you can simply add a new tab on your desktop portal, and then you can go into the Add Content menu, and under the Processes submenu, you have a list of all of the out-of-the-box visual process flows that we give you. To add a visual process flow to your desktop, you simply drag the name and drop it onto your desktop where you'd like it to appear. And visual process flows, again, are just helpful navigation tools that help us move through X3 a lot quicker than having to jump through the menus and try and remember where all of these functions are. We've got a couple of out-of-the-box visual process flows to help us with ensuring that transactions are reported and posted and ensuring that our fiscal period ends are managed and processed successfully. So I actually have two here, one for posting transactions, one for dealing with periodic processing, and we'll talk about these specifically. So, as I mentioned, the first step is to make sure all of your transactions are entered. The second step is to make sure that all of your transactions have been posted. And that's the validation process. And that's where this posting visual process flow comes in. Because from there, we have the ability to validate our invoices. We have the ability to validate our payments. We also have the ability to run the stock accounting interface and the WIP accounting interface. Those are the things that we would need to perform before we can be ready to close the year. And again, in terms of journaling, in, in terms of making sure that all of our transactions are recorded, under the periodic processing visual process flow, we can deal with reversals, we can deal with simulations, we can deal with recurring journals. All of the things that we would need to make sure that have been recorded in order for me to successfully close out the period. Now, as I mentioned, 
one of the first things that you would do after you make sure all of those things are done, or before, because the pre-closing verification report will let you know what needs to be performed before you can close out the period. I do have a link here to the pre-closing verification on both of the visual process flows. So I can just go to the pre-closing verifications report, and I can run it for the period that I'm trying to close. In fact, for me, I'll run it for the entire year. And we'll take a look at what it, what it reports. <coughs> so one of the things that it tells me right away is that there are temporary journals that need to be run, that need to be finalized before I can close out the period. And again, this pre-closing verification report will also let me know if I need to run my stock accounting interface, if I need to run my WIP accounting interface, if there were any recurring entries that needed to be generated. Everything appears in the pre-closing verification, and that becomes sort of like a checklist that I can use at the end of the period to make sure I do all of these steps before I run my period close. Now, what this is telling me is this is telling me that, again, I've got certain journal entries that have been generated, but they're sitting as temporary journals and they need to be finalized. So the last step before I can actually close the period is to finalize my journal, to validate my journal. So I can go back to the posting visual process flow and then go to validate journal. And if you don't navigate using the visual process flows, you can find all of those functions for validation and for running the pre-closing verification. All of those are obviously accessible on the menu as well. So I'm going to actually run this for my particular company, and I'll run it to an end date of 12-31-2012. Say okay, and it will identify by document number those documents that have been finalized. So I finalized all my documents. I've run my validation, I've ensured all of my transactions are, are complete. If I rerun my pre-closing verification report, it should come up clean. And it does. I have nothing outstanding for period 11 and nothing outstanding for period 12. So now I can go ahead and close the period. So again, this is the visual process for the periodic processing, I do have a period close function. And when I navigate to that, it's important to note here that we're actually closing the period in the window from which we manage our period. So from the fiscal period window, and you can see here that that can be found under common data GL accounting tables, we can look at our fiscal years, and for each of the fiscal years we have our period, I can see what the status of the period is, and I can see what the stock status is. And the stock status basically allows me to control whether stock is able to be moved in that period or not. Once the period is closed, obviously the stock status will be closed as well. But I can actually lock a period down from stock movement, but still keep the period open for financial transactions if necessary. But as you can see here, my period 11 and my period 12 are open, and I'd like to close them. So to close the period, I can simply just click on the close button. That's going to allow me to choose what period I'd like to close. And I can close one period at a time, or I can close multiple periods, so long as I have uh, nothing outstanding from that pre-closing verification report. And I can go ahead and say OK. Now, because we're closing period 12, period 12 is the last period of this fiscal year. I will get this warning. And that just basically means that I'm closing this last period in this fiscal year. All the periods are closed. That means I can no longer enter transactions in this year. So I'm going to go ahead and say OK. And again, if I, if I were not able to close the period, I would get a log file that, showed me, that would show me all of the things that I would need to perform, which is exactly what that pre-closing verification report allows me to do. So if I didn't run that pre-closing verification and I just came straight here to close the period, I would get those same notifications that there were temporary journals that needed to be validated, and I would have to go back and do that, then come back here and close the period. 
I've saved that extra step by running that pre-closing verification first, doing what I needed to do, and then coming here and closing the period. And that's really how simple it is to close the period. Again, you're doing that from within the fiscal period, from the same screen where you're managing your fiscal period. And so that takes me back to the PowerPoint where we can talk about some additional considerations for dealing with period closes. And one is that periods must be closed in sequence. In other words, I can't have period six closed but period five open. I need to have period five open and period six open. So your periods must always be closed in sequence. Future periods can be locked. And I'll, I'll show that in a little while. But there are different statuses for the periods. If, it's, if the period is open, then that means that I can record transactions against it. If the period is closed, then obviously the period is closed. There have been financial transactions. There have been transactions recorded in that period. But that period is now closed to additional transactions. But there is a period called not open, which means that that period is locked. It's empty. There are no transactions, but I'm not allowing transaction entry in that period yet. That's great for managing future periods in a fiscal year. And there's a process that we can run for that. And likewise, your closed periods can always be reopened. And there's a very, very simple process for reopening the period. So to do that, the first thing to talk about is, let's talk about that period lock. So as I can see here, these periods are closed. If I go to my period, my next year here, my fiscal year 2013, you'll see that my periods are listed as open here. But for safety reasons, I actually want to close the last three periods. So in other words, the last quarter of 2013. People will have the ability to record transactions in any period that's open. So I want to revert the status of some of these periods to be not open. And to do that, I've got to go through my menu. And from the browser menu, under financials and under utilities, under closures, there is a period closing function. Again, don't, don't confuse this with the actual closing of a period. You close a period in the same screen that you manage your fiscal period. This is to mark a period as being not open. So I can go to my period closing. I can choose my company. And I can say it will actually point to the, uh, the last open period in my fiscal calendar. So I'm going to say I want to close, close period 12 of 2013. I want to mark it as not open. I want to close the next period. And I'll close the third period as well, the, the, the third period in that quarter. And so if I go back to my fiscal periods now, I'm going to use uh, my F7 shortcut key to go back to my previously opened uh, windows. And there's my fiscal period. You'll notice that for the year 2013 now, my fiscal period 10, 11, and 12 are listed as not open. Again, that means that I'm not going to be able to enter any transactions, but there are no transactions in that period to begin with. So again, that's period closing under the financials menu. To close a period, you do it from this window. To mark a period as not open, you do it from the financials menu. And again, from the financials menu, here's where I can click the reopen a fiscal period. Uh, here's my reopen period. I can click on that, select my company, and I can reopen a period. It's going to go to the last closed period and allow me to reopen it. And so those are some of the things that we would deal with for dealing with period ends. And you can see how easy it is of a process to run the period end function. That pre-closing verification report is very helpful for us to identify all of the things that we need to perform in the system. If there are any outstanding transactions that need to be validated, if I need to run any of my uh, accounting interfaces to generate the journal entries, if the journal entries are sitting as temporary, the pre-closing verification report tells me all of that. And I can then deal with 
what needs to be dealt with in order to close the period. And that takes us to steps for fiscal year end. Again, back up to critical, but the steps are equally simple for managing year end. The first step is making sure that your folder, your company is set up to perform the year end. There are certain things that need to be defined in order for you to process a year end. Things like account classes need to be defined to make sure that you're closing out the appropriate GL accounts and you're carrying forward balances in the appropriate GL accounts. Your chart of accounts has to have certain miscellaneous accounts defined for generating your year-end journal entries. There are certain parameter values that need to be defined. Remember that the difference between a period end and a year end is with the year end, the system will generate journal entries for your closing entries and your carry forward balances. And because it's generating journal entries, there is some document setup that needs to be performed. Just as with, any, with entering any transactions anywhere in x you need to have automatic journals defined, you need, you need to have documents defined, you need to have sequence counters defined. That still exists for your fiscal year end processing. So there are certain parameter values that we need to make sure are set up, and that will also include automatic journals. And finally, your journal codes. Every transaction ultimately that generates a, a general journal entry has a journal code. And journal codes can sometimes be date sensitive, so you'll want to make sure that the journal codes that you're using in the next fiscal year are have the appropriate dates or are open. Next thing, in order to close out a year, you have to make sure that all your periods are closed. I think that goes without saying. All your periods need to be closed in order for you to close out the year. And the, ne the next year and period must be open. So if I'm closing out, my fiscal year ended on December 31st, 2012, I need to make sure that January, the, the month of January for 2013 is open because the system will generate carry forward balances on that first day of that first period in the next year. So before I even close out the previous year, I need to make sure that the next year and the first period in that year is open. And then I can run my fiscal year end. Now typically, we don't run a physical year end process until we receive our adjusting entries from our accountant or uh, we wait until all transactions have been received for that prior fiscal year so that we can make sure all the transactions are in and then close out. But to ensure that we're running smoothly as we start the new year, because the the transactions for the new year won't 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 stop, we'll still have transactions in the new year, but we might still be dealing with transactions for the previous year. There is a year end simulation that we can run. That doesn't do a physical year end close. It doesn't generate your carry forward entry that doesn't generate those uh, journal entries for um, managing your carry forward balances and closing out your uh, revenue and expense account. Uh, but it does allow you to produce a trial balance with your starting balances for your asset and liability accounts, for your balance sheet accounts, so that you can move forward in the new year. So you can always run the year-end simulation, but you, can, but you would have to run the physical fiscal year-end process in order to generate your closing entries. And so with all of that in mind, let's take a look. And again, I do have a visual process flow. There are visual pro There is a visual process flow that comes out of the box for managing the fiscal year-end process. So this would be a little bit more involved, a little bit more detailed, but the key steps, as I mentioned uh, in the PowerPoint slide deck, are, are still there. Uh, but before we actually do that, again, the first thing that you would want to make sure is that your folder and your company is set up to close the fiscal year. And so to do that, I'm going to go back to the menu and we'll go through some of these setups. So first thing is under parameters, under financials, so you want to make sure that you have your account classes defined. Now that goes without saying because if you have GL accounts, your GL accounts uh, will be assigned to account classes, of course. Okay. But what's important about the account classes is this column right here, the carry forward. You need to 
make sure that all of your balance sheet accounts are labeled as carry forward and all of your income statement accounts are labeled as not carry forward because that's what the system uses to identify which GL accounts need to be closed out to retain earnings and which GL accounts will have a balance carried forward. So that's the first critical thing, making sure that this is absolutely correct for your chart of accounts, that carry forward amount. The next thing is, again, remembering that the system will generate journal entries for your carry forward balances and will close out your journal entries to, will close out your income statement accounts to retain earnings. So you need to make sure in the setup of your chart of accounts under the miscellaneous accounts tab that you have accounts set up for your carry forward and for your retained earnings, of course, your, your profit and loss accounts. You need to make sure that G these GL accounts are defined because by default, your automatic journals that we use to generate, the automatic journals that we use to generate the year-end journal entries will be pulling the GL accounts from here. And you can always physically hard code in GL accounts into your automatic journal, but it would be much easier to manage it using the miscellaneous accounts tab. And next, under general parameters, under parameter values, in the accounting parameter, in the accounting uh, module, there is a fiscal year-end parameter value group. Now this is, for those of you that don't get into parameter values very often, parameter values are just configuration settings for how X3 functions. What's important for your year-end is ensuring that you have automatic journals defined here for your fiscal year-end entries. So we have the ability to choose whether we're doing uh, balance forwards for general and for analytical amounts. Uh, what is the journal, the automatic journal that we're using for closing? What is the automatic journal that we're using for fiscal year-end and so on? Now we have a lot of listings here for journal types. Just remember that SageRPX3 is a multi-ledger function. So for every ledger that we can define for our company, for every chart of accounts that we can use for our company, uh, we can have different um, automatic journals defined here. But again, these are the automatic journals. And the only thing that you need to remember is that, is that the year-end function will generate journal entries. And just like anywhere else in X3, when we're generating journal entries, there is an automatic journal involved. And that's where the automatic journal is defined. And of course, everything along those lines, not just the automatic journal, there is a document type that's defined. That document type will have a, do a sequence counter, and that sequence counter is what will be used to identify the journal entry that we're using. And then the last thing is under common data, GL accounting tables, under general, are journal codes. At the end of the day, every journal entry has a journal code. And the journal codes have statuses themselves. The only thing you need to make sure here as part of your year end is that your journal codes that you're using um, have a start date for the next fiscal year, of course, or an end date if you're stopping, if you're not using those journal codes anymore. Um, that they have a physical end date for the previous fiscal year. So you just need to make sure that your journal codes are open. And journal codes, by the way, are a very good and helpful tool for if we needed to stop certain transactions from being processed at any point in time through the year um, as part of our as part of our period end process, because we have the ability to manage it by date. But from a year-end perspective, you just need to make sure that your journal codes aren't uh, date-sensitive to the year that you're closing. And those are the keys for setup. If I go back to the period and year-end visual process flow, again, you would want to make sure that all your periods are closed. So there is the pre-closing verification that you can run again. You make sure all your periods are closed. The next thing would be to open up the fiscal year. 
And this takes me to the fiscal periods window. I actually need to go to the fiscal year. So if I go to my menu, just to show you where fiscal years and periods are, under common data, under general, here's my fiscal years and periods. So under the fiscal year, I need to make sure that my next fiscal year is open. And my 2013 year is open. My 2012 year is also open, but my 2013 year is open. To open a year, it's quite simple. I can simply click on opening, select the year that I want to open, and I can say OK. When I'm finished that, I also need to make sure that my period is my periods are open. And from this window, I actually have the ability to right click and tunnel into the periods. To open periods, again, same thing. I can just simply click on opening and it will open the periods for me. So, of course, I need to make sure that my next fiscal year and period are open in order for me to close out my year. And for me, 20, I'm closing out my fiscal year 2012, so 2013, period one needs to be open. I can run the year-end simulation if I'd like. If I'm not ready to physically close my year, I can run my year-end simulation. That will allow me to continue entering transactions in the new year, produce reports, and produce my trial balance with my carry-forward balances, but without having closed out my previous year. But to close the year when we're ready, quite simple. I can simply go into the closed fiscal year process, this is found under financials. You can see here under financials, closing processing, fiscal year end. I can enter my company. Again, being ledger specific, I would be able to specify a ledger if necessary. I could also run my simulation here if necessary. But when I'm ready, I can go ahead and say OK. Now, the year end process generates two journal entries. One journal entry to manage my carry forward, and the second journal entry to take my profit and loss and put it into my retained earnings. You can see what the document, what journal entries have been created here as part of the log for my fiscal year end process. So I can actually exit out of there and let's go to the menu and we'll go into financials where we record our journal entries. And my journal entries started with a CF. So I'll do a quick select here or a quick search on my carry forward entry. And these are the two carry forward entries that were generated. The first journal entry records my carry forward amount. And it also closes out my income and my income statement account to a carry forward GL account. So it puts it into a carry forward GL account. And the second journal entry takes that amount from the carry forward and puts it into my retained earnings account. So those are the two journal entries that you're going to be looking for for the year end process. And then just to verify, if I go into my common data, GL accounting tables, and I go to my fiscal years, my period 2012 is now closed. And to verify that everything is fine, if I go back to my period and year end, I can print my trial balance for the fiscal year. of 2012, and I can see my my asset and liability account and my income statement account all appearing, and if I do the same for my next fiscal period, my next fiscal year I should say, unfortunately I've gone ahead and done transactions in this fiscal year. So you will see some transactions sitting here for my expense accounts, but they're minor transactions sitting here for my expense accounts. Bottom line here is that my expense accounts are all sitting at zero 
no carry forward balances, but my asset and liability accounts have balances carried forward. So that's, that, that's the basic step for performing a year-end. Just remember that, again, performing the year-end, you need to make sure that there are certain aspects of your company defined to manage the year-end, to perform the year-end, and then you just run the year-end process, and that's going to generate two journal entries, one for your carry-forward and another one to roll your retained earnings account, roll your uh, profit or loss into retained earnings. Some other year-end considerations that need to be taken into account, of course, is that, again, as was mentioned, all periods in the fiscal year must be closed. Again, that should go without saying, but helpful reminder for you, before you close out your year, make sure all your periods are closed. And when you close that last period in the fiscal year, you will get that warning saying that you're closing the last period. And closed years can be reopened. Just like periods, the years can be reopened. Uh, there is a reopen fiscal year function in financials that you'd have the ability to run. It will reopen your, your transactions. It will reopen your, uh, your fiscal year. But what it doesn't do is it will not reopen your period. So it's a two-step process. So the first thing you do is you reopen the fiscal year, and then after that, you reopen the period. So just to show you where that is, I go to the menu. Under financials, under utilities, and closures, here's the reopen fiscal year. Very simple process. I would reopen the year, and then I would reopen the period. So it is a simple process, but it's a two-step process to reopen the year and then the period. So hopefully you see now how simple month-end and year-end is. Month-end very helpful because we give you that pre-closing verification report that will tell you exactly what you need to do to perform your period end. Year end, once all your periods are done, there is a simulation that can be run, or you can just simply run the year end function to close out the year. And that takes us to 1099. Now, the reason we're including 1099s is part of your calendar year end reporting, you would need to report on 1099s. And there's some new functionality that exists with 1099s as of version 6.4. So if you're not on version 6.4 yet, um, hopefully you'll see how much easier it is to manage 1099s in version 6.4 moving forward. Before we actually get into what we need to run as part of our year-end processing for 1099s, it's helpful to review setup and transaction entry. And I will say that in OnStage University, in our What's New in Version 6.4 and What's New in Version 6.5 Anytime Learning videos, we've got these topics in greater detail. So you'll be able, you'll, you can review those uh, as necessary. But just as a quick recap, it's helpful to go over this because this is new functionality. In terms of setup, there is a, a, a simple parameter that we need to verify is defined in order for us to work with the new 1099 functionality. And then under common data, we have to define our, our 1099 boxes and our BP suppliers. And then transaction entry would be the same as we've always done. We enter our invoices the same way. However, we now have 1099 fields accessible on the transaction entry windows. So let's just go through that very, very quickly. First thing I'll review is under setup, under general parameters and parameter values. Again, if you're not familiar with this particular uh, aspect, um, this is just our, your configuration settings for how XB functions. Uh, you wouldn't be playing around in here, so you'll want to check with your consultant or your business partner um, before you edit any of these. But under the accounting module, there is a 1099 management parameter value group. And in this, you're just going to want to make sure that this is referring to 1099. By doing this, this will unlock all the necessary features. Um, getting a little bit more technical, there is a feature behind this called activity code. That activity code must be active in order for you to access all of the 1099 functionality. But this is the first step. 
The second step is making sure that your common data is defined. So under common data, under BP tables, we've got our 1099 boxes here. And we have pretty well most of the boxes that are typically used predefined for you. But if you need to add any additional boxes for reporting purposes, you can simply scroll to the bottom, add in the type of box that it is, and add in your details as necessary. For anybody that's on the Canadian side of the, the border, um, we can use the 1099 functionality for CPRF tracking, and we can set up our own custom boxes here if necessary. So that's the first thing. There is an additional step where if you had certain suppliers that needed specific values for 1099 boxes, there are a lot of text boxes or text values that need to be recorded for the suppliers. I can set those up here as well. So for a particular BP, for a particular company, I can choose the 1099 form, and for that box, I can add in the appropriate text. So all of that can be defined for us. Then under the BP records, we would set up our 1099 default. So for a particular supplier, I can go onto the accounting tab. Oh, sorry. That was the BP record. I go onto the supplier record. And I go on to the financial tab. I have the ability to define my 1099 form and default box here. That's going to be my default for when I do, when I record or when I use that supplier on transaction entry. I can always override it on transaction entry, but this would be my default here. And that takes us into transaction entry. And I won't go into showing you how to record a transaction because that all stays the same. But what I will show you is that on your transaction entry now, and I'll just show you this through a supplier BP invoice, we now have visibility and access to 1099 information, both at the header level and at the detail line level. So you can see here I can choose at a detail line whether that is 1099 reportable or not, whether that amount is going to be included in my 1099 amount. That means that on an individual invoice by invoice basis, I can go down to the detail line level to choose what's being reported as 1099 amounts and what's, what's not being reported as 1099 amounts. And of course, once you pay those invoices, whether it's a, an AP, uh, a BP supplier invoice, or whether it's under a purchasing for purchasing invoices. Again, the 1099 codes appear there as well, and you have the ability to edit those fields as necessary on a purchase invoice. But once you actually pay those, those, those uh, invoices, your 1099 statistics are being updated. And that takes us to managing the year-end for 1099. The first step would be to calculate your 1099 payment. There's a, there's a process that you can use that says, go out and take a look at all the transactions and calculate the summary or the details for all of the 1099s that were entered in the transactions. Then the second task would be to review those 1099 amounts. We do have reports that will give you some of that information, but we also have a window that gives you the ability to review 1099 amounts for specific suppliers and you also have the ability to tunnel into transactions that are shown on that uh, inquiry window and also edit 1099 amounts if necessary. And then finally, we have a 1099 forms function that allows you to produce a file for reporting 1099 amounts or print your 1099 reports as necessary. So if I go into S3, now unfortunately we don't have a visual process flow for that, for any of the 1099 functionality, but we've summarized all of those steps under APAR accounting under 1099. And one of the things that wasn't mentioned on that PowerPoint slide is the beginning balance function. If you've migrated to version 6.4 or higher in the middle of a year, and you need to record your 1099 beginning balances, you have the ability to come in here and do this. You simply 
call up a company, call up your supplier, and for a particular 1099 box, you can put in a beginning balance amount. Now, this is used for cutting over in the middle of a year to bring in your, your beginning balances for uh, any particular uh, year. But you can also use this to do uh, year-end adjustments and things like that for balance, for 1099 balances for suppliers. So you have the ability to use this at any point in time throughout the year. The important things to note with, with beginning balances are it's not a physical transaction. So there is no posting function. There is no validation function that we need to be run. And whatever changes we put here on our beginning balances, those are going to reflect right away in the year-to-date numbers for that particular supplier. Okay, so you have the ability to work with beginning balances. But as mentioned, first step would be to calculate your 1099 payments for the calendar year. It will show you what transactions are updating 1099 amounts. And then we have the ability to look up transactions in the 1099 summary window. So I can call up a company, call up my supplier, And I can go ahead and say search. And on the summary window, I will see the beginning balance amount, the 1099 amount throughout the year, the calendar year, and the total. But I do have the ability to right click. I can edit the 1099 information. I can edit the beginning balance information. Or I can go back all the way into common data and adjust the supplier's 1099 uh, text boxes. But if I go edit 1099 data, I now have the ability to see all of the individual transactions where 1099 amounts were reported. I do have the ability to physically edit those 1099 amounts, as you can see here on the right-hand column. And I also have the ability to tunnel into either the invoice or the payment relating to that particular 1099 amount that's being reported. So you do have a lot of functionality here for working with and managing your 1099 amounts and reporting your 1099 amounts. And the final step would be obviously to produce your 1099 form. Now this is going to generate a file, a text file that you can then use to create the file that you need to create for reporting your 1099s if you're electronically filing. Or you can actually produce your 1099 miscellaneous report or your 1096 report here. We've got those reports predefined for you. So once you're ready, you have the ability to generate and produce those reports. And that's really it for the 1099 processing. It's quite simple to do once you have all of your transactions entered for your 1099 amounts. Now, again, just to be clear, that functionality for 1099 exists as of version 6.4 or higher. And that concludes this particular lunch and learn. Hopefully, in this session, you've learned how to close a fiscal period, how to close a fiscal year, how to work with that 6.4 1099 functionality, particularly for year-end reporting, and how to successfully navigate the month and year-end process with ease. For additional learning on some of the topics that we've included in this lunch and learn, I, some of the suggested courses for you to take would be our financial accounting series funded.